Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's get started. So last week we had our presentations. That was awesome. Everybody did a really great, good, great job. Um, I think I have to submit midterm grades really soon, or I don't know if that's an option or it's like a. Someone wrote this something about fail. that, huh? This pass fail. This pass fail? Okay. Have you taught here before? I think you can do it here. I feel like I, so I thought I, I thought for some reason I recall doing grades. No, it is pass fail, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. That's fine. <laughs> anyway, um, how embarrassing. Well, um, so, so basically last week we, we kind of started slowly on generative models. We discussed well, we kind of introduced PCA the week before, and then last week we, we finally kind of introduced GANs and like what they are. And today, um, what we'll do basically today is, is kind of have a tutorial on big GANs, which is the easiest way for us to start playing with them and kind of seeing some of their properties. Um, we'll, we'll do a tutorial later today. And then actually, this is, this is wrong. I'm gonna do things a little bit out of order. I'll probably show you, try to show you some some extra tools that'll be useful for working with data sets. Um, so how to scrape images and stuff from, from the internet, how to um, prepare data sets so that they are in the right dimensions for particular you know pipelines. And then um, maybe the, uh, we'll see if we can get to something like StyleGAN today. That might be something that ends up it might be something that we have to do next week. Um, there actually, just today, actually, there was a post that there's a new ground-up implementation of StyleGAN, which which has different resolution options, which is really cool. StyleGAN has been square for a really long time, and so this might actually might give us some more flexibility. I need to take a look at it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but um, but yeah, so we're just going to get into gener like more into the meat of generative models. And then this is kind of the schedule. So last week we did our presentations. We kind of started in generative models. And then this week we're going to do this big GAN tutorial, get into, yeah, have, have a look at some of these scrapers and tools that I'd like to show you. Um, and next week will be, uh, that's the fifth. We're, we're going to have, we're going to talk probably about style again and try to see, um, uh, I'll try to show you at least a few pointers on how to train something like style again or DC again. StyleGAN is really hard to train because you need resources. And so everyone does have those resources in HPC, but it is there's a little bit of a steep learning curve to, to getting into it. Um, but but it's still worth looking looking at. Um, DCGAN is a little bit easier. And then also I'll show you some of the image to image stuff. So things like picks to picks and, and spade. Um, and uh, and yeah, and that that's kind of and then experimental just means like maybe some miscellaneous things will, will, will come in. And then we'll be off for two weeks, uh, November 12th and November 19th. So we'll have a big gap. And then during that time, it's probably a good time to kind of start plotting your your finals because the last two, then then after, after that, we only have three weeks left and one of them is presentations. And then the two weeks leading up to presentations will probably be kind of like a hodge you know, just sort of like a hodgepodge of, of miscellaneous things, which may or may not be um, like especially easy. They, they may not be easy to integrate into a project. So uh, just because they're happening late and also because they're just kind of miscellaneous. Um, but maybe not. I don't know. Uh, people might get inspired by some of these things. Um, so I would say that like, you know, the stuff that you've learned and, and also the stuff that you um, have now is kind of the, you know, it's probably the meat of, of what you'd be able to use for finals. Um, is that a hint? No, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, so let's get into it. Just a quick review. Last week we <laughs> talked about what generative models are. They're, they are uh, models that are, they learn a distribution of you know, data sets that they're trained on, whether those are images or sounds or text or, you know, whatever else. And uh, typically they are, uh, they have this kind of, you know, from the highest level, you can think of them as these um, networks which take a 
what's what we call a, a latent input vector or something like that, latent vector, latent code, and um, turn that into a sample which resembles the training set that it was trained on. And these uh, latent vectors have all sorts of properties depending on how they're trained. So there's a lot of different kinds of architectures for GAN that, um, so this big F here is just a big, big overview. And then you can get into endless details about different ways of, of architecturing these that um, attach certain kinds of properties to these uh, vectors. And often you'll see GANs used in tandems with other, GANs and autoencoders used in tandem with other with other things like let's say word vectors or something like that that might condition the latent space on some kind of um, you know some some other kind of data you know if you're interested in making a text to image for example then you you would have um, kind of word vectors or, or language vectors of some sort in one side of this and so there's a lot of different ways that this can be structured but the overview is, is something like this um, and um, their generative models are very good at modeling uh, the distributions of things. So you can think of images as points inside of, a, inside of a space. Now this could be either the pixel space or it can be a latent space. Um, and in either case, you'll, you'll find that there's some sort of like a non-uniform distribution of either actual images from a data set or you know, likely images, uh, depending on which one you're looking at, that, that would lie very close to each other. And so most data points in, um, in pixel space are nonsense, right? And so really uh, images that we're interested in, they're a very tiny subspace of a, of a space that we are, uh, that they're inside of. Um, so we looked at eigenfaces, you know, this idea of, of using principal component analysis as a very simple generative model. It's very simple because it um, it's completely linear. It's just based on linear <clears throat> linear combinations of, of, of data. Rather than having any non-linearities like neural networks, you can, um, it's just linear algebra and you, you can play with this if you want to get a sense of, if you want to actually work with it, there's a notebook online. And, um, and they, it has all the features that we would have typically with with GANs and autoencoders, there's some sort of a short and latent vector, which is kind of the the um, embedding of these images inside of the space that is characterized by its principal components. And so this is um, just like a very simple generative model that you can play with. Um, so images, we can think of them as being like, okay, our images, we, we want to be able to represent <laughs> images as, as small vectors of high level features. Um, because that's much easier to compute over than just raw pixels. And so, uh, so, this, so PCA is actually a form of dimensionality reduction, so is TSNI, and so is an autoencoder, and so is the neural network, basically. Um, they're all trying to compress information into some small number of knobs that you can kind of turn to change, different fe uh, diff to change the different features of the object. So here's our latent space, you know, let's say, and, and you know, the, the idea of latent space that it should be smooth. So images that, or, or points in that space that lie close to each other should be similar in terms of their high level features. So for example, dogs are similar to each other more than they are similar to cars. And uh, dogs are more similar to cats than they are similar to cars or houses, you know, so there should be some sort of a smooth um, space. And you can also find sort of, you can think of the vectors between points as representing some sort of a change vector. So, you know, the vector from this to this is the vector that changes a car into a dog, right? And then you can isolate uh, change, you know, direction vectors, which, um, which, might, uh, you, 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 which might isolate a particular feature. So let's say you have a latent space that's full of images of faces you might find that you can find a direction which puts a mustache on any face without a mustache, something like that. Or there's a gender vector, or there's a brown hair vector, or something like that. Um, and, uh, and so those can be very useful uh, because, you know, a lot of the times, like the whole point of these generative models is to generate content. And so we want to have some control over the content. The original um, generative models, GANs and autoencoders and stuff, 
they uh, did not really give us very much control. So the way that the latent space would get distributed would be sort of very messy. And so we were just kind of left with having to probe the latent space in order to find where features were located. Um, now there's a lot of different kinds of you know, architectures that actually try to impose some sort of a useful, um, useful, in, uh, useful structure on top of it. So for example, like let's say you're, um, you know, you, like ideally, let's say one of the elements in the latent vector, like one dimension controlled something like the rotation of the thing or the pose or something like that, something, something useful. Because otherwise, usually the actual changes are not isolated to one element, but they're actually dispersed in the entire space, which is annoying. <laughs> So it'd be nice to be able to disentangle them somehow. And then, you know, some of these, something like InfoGAN tries to do that. Um, otherwise, we're kind of left to probe it. One way of learning one of these latent uh, representations, besides for PCA, is something like an autoencoder. So that's a neural network, which um, is, it, it's an unsupervised learning algorithm characterized by a neural network. Unsupervised means there's no labels, right? Well, okay, so these images of digits, they do have labels, but we're not using them. So the point of these, um, these is that this neural networks, it's, it job, its job is to take in the pixels of this image, and then um, after a fu full forward pass to actually reconstruct the exact same inputs. And, um, and to do so, despite the fact that it goes through some central bottleneck, where um, the number of the, the latent space here, the number of neurons that are left over to model this entire image, whatever goes through it, is actually really small. And so the network is forced to learn a compre uh, compression and decompression, uh, an effective compression and decompression algorithm to reconstruct, to reconstruct it. And autoencoders are, um, they were mostly a curiosity for a long time. You know, they don't necessarily have like a ton of of applications because they don't produce actually very nice uh, or at least they didn't now they're starting to catch up it seems like but uh, er early on no one was particularly impressed by you know their reconstructions they're kind of blurry and they don't really capture very much diversity and you know they don't necessarily um, scale to more complicated images um, but they do have some nice applications one of them that's really useful is a denoising so let's say you have really noisy Photographs, you can train the autoencoder on all the on very nice photographs, let's say, and then run the noisy ones through it, and then that actually gets rid of the noise. And that, so that's actually kind of a, a nice little, um, it, at least that works in, in relatively, in a relatively narrow set of circumstances, but it works. Um, there's variational autoencoders, which actually um, are much better for generation. And, um, but they, they were mostly sort of like right now, no, or the last few years, no one's been very excited about them because of GANs, but, um, there is actually still a lot of work in them and they do have some important advantages over GANs. And so maybe, maybe things will kind of, you never know, you know, things are always kind of, um, swinging back and forth. Um, so yeah, there's another view of autoencoders, uh, kind of mentioned this whole compression decompression idea. GANs are kind of the same as autoencoders, except they're structured a little differently. Where now the the two, so you can think you can think of the you can think of an autoencoder as being two neural networks in a sense that are connected. So really, they're one neural network. But one, the first half is the encoder that gives you a latent latent embedding, and then the second half is a decoder which takes a latent embedding and produces a real image. And so GANs are kind of like that in the sense that the there's a generator and a discriminator, and the generator is effectively like the the decoder in the autoencoder, and the discriminator is um, well. There's no encoder anymore in the GAN. Uh, there's nothing that takes an it, it, there's nothing that takes an image and gives you latent code. Instead, there's this classifier called a discriminator, whose job is to tell apart whether uh, tell whether this is real or fake. The reason why this works better than this is that um, the only really good way of doing like, okay, the, the idea for an autoencoder is that it's supposed to reconstruct the input as the output. Um, but how do you decide what is considered a good reconstruction? So the way an autoencoder does it is just by pixel to pixel. It's like a mean squared error over all of the pixels. 
Uh, but that doesn't work that well because you might have an identical image which is shifted over by a few pixels and then you would get a high error for that. Um, so that doesn't really work very well. So instead the insight that, um, that G Gans kind of provided, that Ian Goodfellow, the person who came up with Gans, had this insight which is that why not instead of using, instead of using this reconstruction idea, why not use another neural network to be kind of the judge because neural networks are really good at that, that sort of thing. They're good at classification. So this is kind of what um, was the innovation that let us make really, really sharp instead of blurry images of strange people. Um, <laughs> and um, GANs, like autoencoders, like PCA, like all these others, they have these, um, you know, uh, embeddings that have feature change vectors that you can find. So for example, if you find a part of the latent space that has a whole bunch of images of people with glasses, and then you find a whole bunch of pictures of people without glasses, then you can kind of figure out what the direction that changes, um, that puts on glasses is, let's say. And then you can do things like this. This is the original DC GAN paper. And then uh, just two years later, this was progressively grown GANs by NVIDIA. Still a little bit uncanny looking faces, but high resolution and, and a lot more detail. Sometimes people's foreheads would disappear. Um, you know, just some weird things, but otherwise like actually pretty impressive. And then just a year later than that, they followed up with StyleGAN, which we'll, which we'll look at. This is the joke that I did where I tried to locate celebrities in, inside of the progressively grown GAN video. Um, their whole, yeah. Right? I mean, have you ever seen them in the room together? That's the, who, who would think? Um, so yeah, this, and then the other cool thing about uh, this, this progressively grown GANs from 2017. So first of all, the, the way they work, I didn't really mention it, this whole progressively grown idea is that GANs for a long time were limited by uh, the size. So um, the original DC GAN was really kind of optimized for 32, 64 pixels, something like that on each side. And you know, you could try to make them bigger, 128, 256. Um, we like powers of two, as you can see in computer science. Um, but, but the problem is that it's just too much of a distribution to learn from scratch. It's too many pixels. Um, the distribution is too sparse. But, um, um, but the idea with progressively grown GANs is, okay, you, um, you can't learn 256 or 512 or whatever from scratch, but maybe you can learn a smaller representation and then actually add another layer, which will, which will make the output uh, bigger. And so you first learn the small one, and then you scale it up by a resolution of two, and 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 kind of almost like transfer learning in a sense, like you're piggybacking on what you've learned about the distribution when it was a little bit easier. And then you do this multiple times, and then you can get up to a resolution of 10, 24 pixels in their case. Um, and um, turns out that it works really well. Um, and it's even similar, like maybe this is a little bit too pedantic, but, the, but before deep learning was really successful, there was um, they, uh, the, way that, like, the way that deep learning people would try to work is instead of training from end to end, they would train one layer at a time. Um, this is, uh, I forgot what this was called. I'm just racking my brain. Jeffrey Hinton was kind of the pioneer of these. They would train one layer at a time, basically. Man. Deep belief nets? No. Is that something else? Maybe deep belief nets. Um, yeah, I forgot. Well, anyhow, this is a bit of a similar, a little bit of a throwback. Those aren't really used anymore. But um, but anyhow, this kind of resembles that, I, I'd say. Yeah? And then for those gifts, I, I think we've gone over it, but these are, this is just moving along a vector between images or... So it's just basically a random traversal through the latent space. Okay. And, and actually they, they might be zigzagging between like maybe, I, I think, I, so I made these actually. The thing is that NVIDIA, uh, they even released the models for these. So they released the software and the trained models. They didn't release the training code initially, I think, but they released the actual models. And so then you could just download the models and then just generate with them. So you have this cat generator that was released by NVIDIA. 
So um, at this point, I can't remember exactly how I made it, but I think what I did was I like picked a bunch of images that I liked from it, and then I just did zigzags between them. And that's actually not necessarily the best way to do it, because if you do like a line between two points in latent space, you might actually sort of go through some sparse territory. There's kind of more mathematically elegant ways of doing it, like traversing around a sphere, for example, or a hypersphere is actually a little bit better. But, um, but you know, works. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are screens, TVs, bicycles, bedrooms, and so on. This is the meme vector. So yeah, this is what I did with the cat. I took the cat model, and then I found, I basically just took random samples, and then I saved a bunch of the ones that happened to have like the big blocky white letters on them that you see a lot on, you know, whatever it is, like on Reddit or whatever. And then um, just did zigzags between them. And these are just some other um, progressively grown guns that were made by other people. This is a nice little ramen kind of uh, thing, and then or just Chinese food, I guess, generally. And then this is eyes made by Andreas, my my friend Andreas. Some of them are human eyes, some of them are you know cat eyes, dog eyes, stuff like that. So it's, it's a pretty neat little trick. I trained uh, initially. I trained my big data set of wiki art samples on progressively grown again. So this is what that looks like, and so made all these sort of pseudo paintings that would look like you know landscapes and architecture i've re i retrained it since then on style again it's a little better uh, but these are some of the highlights lots of interesting stuff Oops. too far uh, this is what style again looks like so this is now one year after progressively grown gans and now it's just like would you know that this isn't a real person this is like your aunt you know, uh, <laughs> like, so, you know, the ant next door. So, yeah, really, really realistic. There was even um, somebody made this website called This Person Is Not Real, I think, or something like that. I don't remember, the, something like that, This Person Isn't Real, where it would ask you to look at an image for two seconds or something like that and then pick whether it was real or not. You would take this quiz, and that went super viral. Um, Super viral. Somebody met the guy who made it a few few months ago. Uh, just like a random, I think maybe he was a grad student, something like that. Anyway, um, then uh, there's Glow, and this is actually also something I'd like to show you. The thing is, I don't have a ready notebook for this, but I think Glow I can probably put on Colab. Maybe that might make it a lot easier to um, to work with. Glow is kind of interesting because it's a generative model which is um, invertible, uh, which is to say that you can take an, Im an actual image and then project it. You could find the latent code that produces that exact same image. So, so first of all, Glow is capable of generating any combination of pixels. It can generate any image as long as you can find the latent code. The price that you pay is that a latent space is literally as many as there are. It's literally as big as the as the image. So the latent space is is the same size. It's you know whatever it is three. Um, it's like a million elements basically, which means that um, the latent space is super sparse, but it's capable of generating anything, any image that you want. And so if it's trained now that 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 sounds like too good to be true, but it, and it kind of is because. If you train Glow on faces, and then you could technically embed, uh, you know, a car into it, but then if you, but then if you, that's that's really all you can do with it because it will be in some part of the latent space which is so sparse that there's nothing around it that makes any sense. So like you can, tr like I've tried to do this experiment where I embed, let's say, like a dog face in it, and I try to do interpolation between a dog face. And in fact, I might even have it on my computer. <laughs> Let's see. I, I tried to do it between Trump and Trump and a dog. I can't remember. I it, it didn't work. Oh, maybe. Oh, actually, maybe it was a cat Trump. Uh, let's see if I can. Um, interpolations. Just random. Oh well, I do have one. Okay. 
So this is what happens when you try to do an embedding between cats and people. It doesn't really work. <laughs> so the problem is that like it's not trained on cat faces so that it's not very smooth, basically. Anyway, um, but um, but Glow is really awesome because okay, you can, if it's trained on faces, then you can embed a face into it, and then do things with that face. So so I think I I think I showed this slide earlier. I'll I'll probably show it more next week. So let's let's leave it aside for next week. Okay, big ends. Uh, big ends were released by DeepMind um, about I think a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. And when it was initially came out, um, the news that that accompanied it was that they had trained big GANs on on something like 500 GPUs, which is just insane. And so there were actually news articles um, about how much electricity it burns to train one of these. And you know there was I can't remember like, but it was some you know, it's like this. It, it's it's as much electricity as like a house uses in six months, or or maybe like a city uses in six months. I can't remember. Something really outlandish. Six, six days for a city. Is that what it was? Six yeah. days for a city? Yeah. That sounds a little high. I said it was a specific city though, and I don't know you as very well. I'm not a big city like no, you city. I, I don't know. That sounds a bit high. But it, anyway, it used a lot of electricity because it, okay, it had to train for like a few weeks with a 500 GPUs or something. Um, now the thing is, of course, like uh, it's a little bit misleading because for two reasons. One is that the first time around that this is done, it's always really, really slow. Um, but then within some number of months, they figured out how to get this down to something like only <laughs> eight GPUs, which is still pretty hard to get on the like, consumer rig. Um, but it is a, an improvement of like a hundred times almost. So. Um, probably even by now it might be at four GPU, and you know pretty soon I'm sure it's going to work on a you know, on a smart smartphone. Who knows? Um, but but anyhow, like the the reason why they trained it on so many GPUs is that they um, well, there's this kind of insight uh, from deep learning, which is um, there's nothing that can't work better if you just throw more GPUs at it, basically. <laughs> Uh, more GPUs, more neurons, more layers, more images, more everything. Just bigger, 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 bigger. That's really kind of deep learning. Like it's just every make everything bigger. That's why a lot of like mathematicians and and like more classic, let's say, machine learning scientists don't like deep learning because it's just like it's kind of like the triumph of engineering over math. Um, and uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but anyhow, somehow, whatever you know, with deep learning, like it just keeps on getting better. Uh, when you throw more and more compute at it. And in this case, it was able to make things that looked hyper-realistic. So, you know, you have these dogs and, you know, butterflies, burgers, you know, islands and stuff, like really, really. Now, these are cherry-picked a little bit. Like, it's uh, it doesn't work great for every class and it doesn't work great for every generation. These are, these are kind of highlights, uh, but it's still pretty, pretty damn good. Um, Pretty realistic, very sharp, and um, and yeah. Now uh, I'm gonna actually take you through a um, a notebook on Big Gen. That'll be kind of our, our good deed for the day. Um, but uh, we'll probably do it after the break, I think. Um, or well, let's see. Let's see. It's four o'clock. I think actually we can even start it uh, really soon. Yeah, it's it's hot, isn't it? Um, I don't think we can do I feel much like it's about it. Hotter. Yeah, because now there's because now there's more of us in here. Yeah, um, yeah. Is there some way we can we can? You guys are here all the time. Like, what? How do we get the attention of the? This is a hazard. This is a, yeah. Yeah. New building woes. Yeah. In in like the by the shop, I look like. It's like very well air conditioned over there. It's like, it's like is this building is new too, or right? It's like newly renovated. Renovated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Anyhow. Uh, this is this is a really cool thing that um, 
I just like to mention it because it, it's just kind of interesting. It's, <laughs> so, okay, the, the idea with these generative models is that you can just take a big data set of images and you can train the generative model and it will have some latent space and the images that it generates will be distributed through this latent space. Um, however, as I mentioned earlier, there are ways of trying to impose some kind of a structure on the latent space so for, to, for, for you know, various applications that could use it. So um, like for example, like one simple example is just conditioning it on labels. So if you want to be able to generate images of handwritten digits, it doesn't make sense to make images that look like pseudo digits. You want to be able to generate ones and twos and threes and fours and fives and so on on demand. Like when you want to generate a five, you generate a five. Um, so you can condition on labels um, and you can also condition on other kinds of data as well. So you could say like, I want when I receive some kind of an input data for the generator to be conditioned in the, in, you know, in the particular way. Um, so like like before, like I said, with text to image models like attention GAN, it's conditioned on the actual input text. And um, this was something really from from I think now maybe two years ago. Uh, but they let's see if I can get the explanation correct. Um, they basically tried to condition a GAN, a generative adversarial network, on fMRI activity on a human test subject. So here's the idea. The, the person would be shown images on a TV or something of real objects, you know, dogs, eagles, whatever. That's an owl, I guess, you know, just whatever objects. And at the very, at that moment, the uh, person was being scanned by, by, you know, an fMRI scanner or something like that. And they basically tried to make it so that the fMRI scanning data was was the latent space right so um well now why would we do that because then once they train again so that it's conditioned on this fmri activity you could then run it in reverse you could try to input some kind of um you know like pseudo fmri activity um and then try to to uh, e either pseudo or even real fMRI activity, and then generate the the image that it that it's supposed to that you're supposed to be seeing when you have that activity, right? So maybe then you can uh, try to kind of like reconstruct an image from people's uh, brain activity, right? And so so like I like to me this would be and and I, I the first thing I thought of was that like oh my god this is going to be able to record dreams this is how we're going to record dreams so you know you're you're sleeping and there's something you know probing your brain and then saving all that data and then you know you wake up and then you can actually record your dream on on like a video um, so it turns out that imagining is not the same thing as 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 seeing that's kind of the problem but um but i don't care i i really i this is this is the hill i'm gonna die and i want <laughs> i want dream recording um because i don't remember my dreams i don't know about you guys not very well anyway yeah so how does it do the conditioning so that's that's technical like we can i would read the paper if you really want to <laughs> like we can get into that but it's 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 technical <laughs> okay. i mean it's it's like it's beyond the scope of today but um, and and to be honest, like I don't fully understand it myself. But it is it, um, okay. So like okay, for example, you, with um, attention GAN, the um, the input the the latent. So whenever you, the best way to I guess to the simplified way of saying it, let's say, just is that when you have one of these, um, when you're training the GAN, where where am I? Did I miss it? Yeah, like when you're training the GAN, yeah. instead of just generating these randomly, you generate them for, like the you generate them from the um, you know the input, which okay. is the which is the or that's encoded by some. Let's say maybe it's encoded by another neural network. Like you could have a, a variation autoencoder that's encoding into this, or maybe um, maybe you have a word. You know, if you're doing like a text to image, then these are the word vectors. So they could be they could be pre-trained or maybe they're trained end to end, something like that. And okay. maybe there's an additional loss term. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, it starts to get more hairy. Let's say 
Um, but the point is that um, you can condition on things, um, which is cool. So yeah, then they try to reconstruct the image. There's some cool YouTube videos that they have like that show, for example, um, we can even maybe, like I think this tries to, yeah, so this is the reconstruction of each image. So the, this is the idea, oh, because it, before they use, I think, I guess they use some optimization approach to try to, so for each image, this is the reconstructed activity. It's not super good yet, but you know, I think the reason why it looks like this is because they have to do some optimization to find the actual code that generates the image, I want to say. Yeah, deep image reconstruction. So yeah, cool stuff, right? All my recommendations are like, <laughs> my YouTube recommendations laid bare for the world to judge. I just watch chess. Um, yeah, it's all chess videos. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so there's other kinds of generative models and, and uh, for example, skip thought vectors, which are really neat. Um, this is actually pretty old by now, but um, this was the, the idea is that these are language vectors so that it's able to generate text. They're generative models, not just of images, but also of text. So this was one that was conditioned on romance novels. We were barely, and it's generating, we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind. She was in love with him for the first time in months. She had no intention of escaping. It just sounds like it was trained on Dor and, uh, uh, was she, Fifty Shades or something of, uh, what is it, Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? It's not Dorian Grey. Yeah, wait, what is that? That's something that's else. Like the painting with oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Ages right, right, right. <laughs> but isn't the main character in Fifty Shades named Dorian or something, right? It's, it's something gray. Christian Grey. Christian Grey. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's why. That's why. Okay, that's why I. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah, the cool project by my friend Samim, uh, who did a bunch of really cool, like basically telling little romantic stories about different pictures. <laughs> he was a shirtless man in the back of his mind, and I let out a curse as he leaned over to kiss me on the shoulder. He wanted to strangle me, considering that beautiful boy I'd become wearing his boxers. <laughs> it's really great. Um, yeah. Is this like a, you know, like text to or image to text and then the yeah they, it's something like that yeah um I, i've forgotten by now something like that yeah there's also even adversarial uh, there's also gan models of point clouds um now when this was released i thought it was really cool but i they this was already a while ago and i haven't seen any code i really haven't seen very much code in the domain of like sort of point cloud generation and meshes and things like that i think there's kind of a couple of reasons behind that one is that um, 3D stuff is actually harder to do than 2D than, than images because it's a whole other dimension of data. So it requires like an order of magnitude more data, really. And then at the same time, uh, there's no, there's not really very many like, you know, sort of well labeled, kind of structured 3D data sets out there um, because they're hard to. You know, you don't. We don't just have an internet full of images, in, like we like for for three D, like we have with the internet. And so, one of the big thing reasons why deep learning works so well is because it just just happened to come when suddenly it was like you could get a million images. You know, um, it wasn't uh, straightforward to get a million images before before even two thousand and nine. Like it really wasn't straightforward. Um, and so even now it's not very straightforward to get point clouds or meshes or, you know, or even voxels for that matter. I've always had this uh, project idea that like, does anyone here play, um, um, what's it called? Where you make the, you, it's like voxel environment where you make landscapes and stuff. Okay. Uh, my, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Minecraft. So it'd be cool to generate Minecraft levels, right? Like mm -hmm. for the generative model. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for, I, look, I remember looking on uh, like some Minecraft forums for, um, to see if anyone was collecting, if there was some public collection of, because people make their own maps, right? Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't find anything, but that would be really cool. Yeah. 
And actually, you can maybe even do it without um, by taking a 2D approach. You can think of it as like a, as a as a depth map, something and generate the depth map and the texture. Um, so yeah, that's that's just a little idea out there. WaveNet, uh, generative models of audio. You hear that? It's totally generated, yeah. The way you can tell it's a generative model is that it doesn't seem to ever conclude or, you know, repeat. Um, so, the audio, so I can, I, I first became interested in, in um, oh yeah, okay. I first became interested in audio because uh, in machine learning through audio, and I always thought like a generative model of audio. Like I like like ten years ago, I just thought like this will never ever happen. Um, it's too because even then, generative models of images were 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 so like not really. Besides for eigenfaces and you know maybe maybe the first autoencoders, they just you know and all those do is they they were producing. A thousand pixels, but a thousand pixels, quote unquote, of audio, is two milliseconds. Uh, what is that? That's like that's like less than ten milliseconds of audio. <laughs> so um, to generate one second of audio at let's say forty-four thousand samples per second, that's a huge, huge amount of data. And also, like with images, images are more forgiving of noise. Uh, if you have like random perturbations in an audio signal that you generate it just sounds like noise and so this was this was really like it felt like a really difficult thing and it still is pretty difficult but there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of innovation and what WaveNets kind of did was that they used this kind of novel structure to generate the audio using what are called dilated convolutions so at each level they kind of they um, multiply the like the skip the, the stride that they go like how many samples they skip and then uh, by a few uh, after a few of these the what's called the effective receptive field like the how much of the audio is controlled by a particular uh, by one um, uh, like by one input is much bigger and so yeah somehow that's <laughs> somehow magically that makes really decent audio um, and they're getting they're still working on this um, they're trying to make it kind of give it more structure that lasts over multiple seconds or multiple minutes even um, and you know if char rnn was the first language model that that you know that people kind of took seriously and then gpt2 came along and it looked like you could write paragraphs that kind of made sense then i think we're kind of on a time delay with respect to audio in that circumstance, but all, but actually it seems like we may be able to generate hit songs, you know, within <laughs> some number of years. Uh, yeah? Can you see this bronze AI thing? It's like an AI tool for music makers. I'm trying to figure yeah. out if it's one of these or if it's like a scam and just claims to be AI. <laughs> I, ha I, haven't, I haven't heard of it. Okay. Do you know who it's made by? Um, I'm on their website. Uh, I think they're just like their own company. But yeah, like um, there are a couple artists that released albums and now like Arc is doing an installation like the Met with them. But yeah, it's, I was just like looking at it and they're very vague about what technologies they actually use. Yeah, like do they have a GitHub or anything no, like yeah, that? There's no code. Actually. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if there's no GitHub, that means they're probably just using research code and then, you know, you know making fancy claims about it. Yeah, this whole fMRI activity thing, by the way, for example, was basically um, taken by a very, very famous artist named Pierre uh, Huig or something like that, and he did like a whole thing based on it. Um, you know, so most of the public doesn't see this stuff, and then, and then you know, you can kind of like um, you know, make a really big, big deal of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you, so you're saying you said this about audio. I think you said about like high resolution images before. Like you don't think you didn't think it was possible at the time. 
Is there anything you can think right now that won't be possible in the future? That won't be possible? Yeah. I mean, I mean, like the, I guess that would be everything that I haven't thought will be possible. Like I haven't thought of everything that could be possible in theory. I don't know if like, <laughs> it's, it's a really, yeah, it's a really, yeah, yeah, like maybe, maybe we won't be able to, you know, like generate a human being from scratch, but maybe we will. Well, I guess maybe the question then is like, is there, you sort of talked about 3D models, is there something that you have thought that you would like to try and do that you haven't been able to do yet? So like you talked about trying to make like a Minecraft level, is there another sort of... Making, yeah, making hit songs, yeah. that would be awesome, like that would be making entire films, like maybe, mm. I don't know, I haven't necessarily, I don't keep my eyes too far in, over the horizon, I kind of try to... Try to stick with what's what seems to be like learn from the bottom up, let's say. But um, so so really, I'm just kind of thinking of more scaled up versions of things that we can do today. But um, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm not sure I want AI. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Um, oh, maybe okay. So like, you know. Maybe, you know, the matrix, basically, like mm -hmm. full body, sort of um, full immersion, it, you know, your entire, all of your senses are, are basically, pro, you know, you have, you're, and actually maybe it wouldn't even, so my friends said that this would be achieved through brainstem hacking. So basically you just put something in the brainstem and then all the signals that you would normally get from your sensory apparatuses is just hijacked. And then you're, um, you're just fed whatever you live in some simulation and you know, you're the star, everything's great. <laughs> Everybody lives in their own pod. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and so, yeah, hey, why not? I don't know. Seems, seems, seems beats being, beats being like really, really like, old and on the on the edge right <laughs> like i don't know <laughs> like, like i don't want i don't want to be i don't want to be too inappropriate here but like i i'd be if if the matrix comes along when i'm like a hundred i'll be like just in time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Test. yeah yeah test yeah well i don't know <laughs> i might not be brave enough to be like the first test person <laughs> i think maybe i'll leave that to 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 what's this to who's gonna do that Elon probably mm -hmm. right <laughs> you'll probably be you'll probably it'll probably be something that super only super rich people can do initially so um, failing that which so, so far I am um, I'll have to wait my turn no. so we'll see yeah <laughs> um, well one cool thing I want to mention that there uh, this is prob this is outdated now I don't even know if this project is active but. When the initial WaveNet came around, uh, it was closed source, and um, some people uh, decided to get together and try to re-implement re it. And um, and I was involved in this a little bit, mostly just kind of on the audio side. And I made a um, a uh, like a, this is trained on Opera WaveNet, so it's not quite as good as. Um, you know the the uh, oh you can I, I don't have the let's put that on okay this was trained on Opera oh there's nothing coming out why not oh sorry <laughs> Okay, it's not, it's not exactly noise. It's like you can hear like some weird tenor voices and, and that sound that sounds like a, when an orchestra is tuning. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of, of that in there, I think. Anyway, um, that was... Uh, I don't remember now. I probably trained it for too long, actually. I think maybe like a, a week or something. There's other, there's really... Oh, um, there's other stuff. Uh, oh, this is more recent work with um, that Sander did, basically making wave nets better. A 
bad, right? It's a ghost piano. It's like, uh... Um, some work on top of WaveNet that's a little bit more, like, practical, let's say, it was Magenta. Magenta is a group at Google that does a bunch of, does a bunch of, like, art and AI experiments. And one of the things that they did was um, basically building these, um, these musical instruments on top of WaveNets. So, for example, you could use WaveNets to model different instruments and then you know, just like as you do with generative models, you can then combine those instruments. You know, so that's kind of cool. Um, there's also like Lyrebird, which is um, a voice modeling company that's attempting to um, do like really, really good voice modeling. So here's a sample. Um, hey, Doc, have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Lyrebird. This is huge. It can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey, guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Hillary is right. I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do a good job. I think this was done around the election, so yeah. that's why it has the voice that it does. So it's actually pretty old now. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what they're up to, and you know, there's there are other, there are open source versions of this out there. So you could train a voice model, for example. That's another thing that you could you could do. So you could train a face model and a voice model. You could make an avatar of yourself. That's out there. That would be a really great final project. Yeah. <laughs> make your own avatar. Um, so, and then I, they, for a while they had, I'm not sure if they still have it now, but they had a demo where you, they would let you record a bunch of sentences that they would give you into a microphone and then you would get a model of your voice. So this was, this was mine. Oak is strong and also gives shade. The, the pipe begins, begins to rust while new. Thieves who rob friends deserve jail. The right, the right taste, taste of cheese improves with age. age. Cats and dogs each hate the other. Move the vat over the hot fire. The hog crawled under the high fence. Act on these orders with great speed. Yeah. yeah. Not bad, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the intonation's a little bit, you know, mechanical, let's say, but um, but you know, kind of works. You could do. I think the last time I checked, the demo wasn't working, or at least it wasn't working in Chrome or something like that. But maybe you can, you might have better luck than me. Is, it, is that what Amazon's doing like Alexa stuff? Um, like good question. I know that Google's uh, own all of their audio. I think WaveNet is now handling, or, or you know, some, I don't know if it's WaveNet anymore, it might be something like built on top of that, but they're doing all of their audio generation using these, you know, um, using these like uh, models. The, you could still do a really good job with stuff that's kind of specifically engineered to do voice stuff. Um, so a lot of the, you know, we've had like voice robots and stuff for years, right? It's just that um, before, all of that stuff was really, really sort of like you. It was it was um, very meticulously engineered. Uh, a lot of it was just straight up recorded, right? So that was one thing. But then also you could do things like make vocoders. So something like a vocoder can change the change the timbre of a particular voice. And so a, a lot of it is just kind of that. But uh, I I don't know what Amazon is doing. But I think ultimately this stuff is generally shifting towards generative models because it's just so much more scalable. Um, you know, that's kind of the, yeah, I would say these things will, this is something I would say like it, within the next few years, it's, it's just gonna be more and more kind of every day. Yeah. I remember seeing an assistive tech project where people could donate their voices to create more accurate uh, voice readers for people that couldn't talk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they could, as they got older, if they were a kid or adolescent, they could change their voice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah, uh, that, that is, yeah. Our voices change as we get older, I guess, very slowly. Yeah, and I think the options were just so robotic sounding, the default. That yeah. They wanted something that felt more like themselves. Yeah. I remember reading something how, like, Stephen Hawking, you know, his whole voice the old voice robot was like really really primitive like really old old school and i think he just like refused to change it he really you know because people had gotten used to they associated that sound with him yeah but um yeah no more
Okay, I think I mentioned this, deep learning frameworks, lots of them out there. And uh, I think we'll, let's take a break now and then I'll kind of get, go through this list and we'll do a big GAN tutorial um, after the break. All right. Okay, um, everyone's, uh, everyone's ready? Okay, so the, the thing that I'm gonna uh, do today and uh, this will probably take up most of the rest of today. We'll see, we, hopefully we should, I'll try to leave just a little bit of time to go over some data set utils. We may not get a chance to, to really dive into this, so maybe I'll just do like a sort of survey of them and then maybe we may do them deeper next week. I don't know, we'll see, kind of depends on priorities. But the thing that I would like to do is to do a demo that everyone can take part in because we have it on Colab. Um, and this, this one is actually a little bit nicer than the NeuralSense demo. Um, it's a little bit cleaner, so, um, and it's going to be a big GAN demo. And um, so this will be, this is optional, like you, you don't, you can just follow along if you'd like, um, but, but for those of you who want to participate, um, please go to the following link. Um, go to ml4a.github.io, as usual, click in guides, and if you go down, you'll see at some point, there is a guide, Big Gans. There's actually two guides that say Big Gans. Um, we're going to do the first one, uh, which is just the Big Gans, which has sampling new images from Big Gan, Big Gan interpolation videos. This will take you to a Colab notebook. Um, so we've already done like one demo with Colab. Um, so, so we should be like relatively familiar with the basics. I'll, I'll kind of go over that. Uh, just a little summary of that really quick, but but basically we can kind of go through it. And if you feel really comfortable with Colab, you can you can actually skip ahead because the notebook is kind of all laid out and we'll just kind of go through it. Yeah? Can you press open in Colab? Yes, exactly. So uh, when you open it, um, I'll just mention really quickly before I get into it, there's a second notebook which you could look at later. This one, this uh, Big Gan Tricks, was made by this guy in Yemen named Zaid who uh, also just does a lot of really cool machine learning, creative machine learning stuff. He made a few runway models as well. Um, so this one you could look at later. There's, a, there's some, some like more, um, there, this, this is really nice because it actually, there's a few tricks that he shows about how the latent space with Big GAN is structured and some things that you can kind of get out of it if you, if you know a little bit more about that. I'll be showing you kind of more, more of the sort of like, you know, the introductory stuff. So, um, so yeah, when you open the notebook, you'll, you should most likely see, um, it says open in playground and, uh, so just go ahead and open in playground. And once you have that, you can also maybe think about making a copy. If you make a copy, you can, you can save changes to it. So you can, you can keep your own running notebook, um, as you go. And then, um, once you're ready to go, like we'll, we'll start going through this. Um, okay, so does anyone have any questions? Just an opening, everyone was able to, to get it. Okay, cool. So um, first of all, like a really quick review for those who, who haven't done any collab stuff except for our neural synth notebook or maybe not even that. Um, like the quickest review, uh, collab is structured as a series of cells. You can activate any cell by clicking into it and the cells are sequential, they, they follow sequentially. And then cells are divided into two kinds of cells. There's text cells, which are which are basically just markdown. Markdown is kind of this format for you know you can make things bold, you can make you know you can get make things uh, bigger font, things like that. It's just for text. You can r write anything in that. And and the rest of the cells are Python code. And um, so like for example, this is a text cell. And when you double click into it, you you can edit it. And then in order to uh, to like, and then once you click away from it, if you click, if you double click, you can edit the text, and if you click away from it, it will just render the text. And for code cells, there's also this gray sidebar, and there's a play button in there, and the play button will execute the code that's in there. So this is code. It happens to be all comments, so this won't do anything. It's just comments because in Python, uh, the hash marks make a comment line. So this is just a you know, that's there. Um, and then you can always make new cells by pressing this plus code or plus text, right? So plus code gives you this cell. This is a code cell. You could do some Python code in there. And when you, um, you 
uh, when you click the play button, it'll, it'll run the command. Uh, you can also, as a shortcut, you can run control and uh, return or control enter is the same as hitting the play button. And also shift enter is the same as hitting the play button and going to the next cell, which can be nice because you could quickly like just run through a few cells if you want to. So just like a few little keyboard shortcuts to be aware of. Um, you know, you can print stuff, hello world. You can import entire libraries. You know, if you wanted to do stuff with NumPy, you could you can, you can make NumPy matrices. So A is a matrix of zeros, that's three by three. Now I'll print A and here's A, oops. Right, so there's a matrix of zeros, matrix of ones. Right, so there's, so, so like you can do, just in general, it's kind of nice because it's a little sandbox that you could do Python experimentation. You can also do Python experimentation in the console. So if you were to open a terminal, you know, and just run Python, you have the same thing going on here, you know, import NumPy and stuff. But the point here is that you also have these notes and they can be shared on the internet and you're not using your own computer to execute the cells. That's kind of the, that's the hidden thing here, which is that when you execute this code, what you're actually doing is that you're sending the code to Google. Google is executing it and then sending you back the results. And the reason why this is nice is because this Colab environment contains um, GPU acceleration. So GPUs and TPUs. Um, and so it's fast. We don't, we don't have like uh, good GPUs on our laptops. And so this, this is, it's a little bit throttled. It's not as fast as having one of these GPUs on your machine because um, Google, you know, obviously they don't want you to use it for everything that you do. Um, so they make it a little bit slow, but it is kind of nice. And so you can kind of, you know, you could do various things with this. I'm just going to get rid of this cell. Um, oops. Um, you can get rid of it. There's a little toolbar here, so you can, you can get rid of a cell that way if you want, just clicking the trash can thing. Okay, so this big gun demo. This is a demo for the big gun generators. This is basically a, I made a more or less a fork of this, which um, has a whole bunch of stuff that I like to show. Uh, this is based on the original uh, big gun notebook, which, which I think there should be a link here somewhere. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's here. Yeah, the notebook is this demo, it's in TF Hub. And um, so let's get started. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're just setting a string to be equal to a URL. And the URL is where the big GAN pre-trained models are. You'll notice that there's three of them. There's one that's sized 128, 256, and 512. And so whichever one of these you, un you keep uncommented, these are comments, uh, it, will, it will set module path to be that variable. And then we'll use that later, we'll load it later. Um, we can use the 512 pixel ones. You know, sometimes it's kind of useful to you, you might be wondering why bother using the small ones. Well, the small ones might actually look better in some cases because, um, you know, small helps in, in train sometimes. But also, um, there is a little bit of a lag. So uh, both for in terms of processing and also in retrieving the images from the server. So if you're doing stuff really quickly, sometimes it helps to prototype on the small ones and then kind of adjust, you know, shift back to the big one. But since we're just going to, you know, and so you can pick whichever one you want, but since we're just going to go through the notebook one by one, I think it's fine to just use the big ones. So go ahead and run play. And just remember, um, uh, just like with the uh, Neurosynth notebook, the thing to keep in mind is, um, number one, this, um, there, it, there's no really sense of, of sequence, like if you run cells out of order, then it computes in that direct, in that way. So like if you run one cell below a few cells, which, which uses a variable, which, which is in the cell above it, if you never ran the first cell, it won't have that variable and you'll have an error. And so like, that's kind of the confusing thing about notebooks. It's not like, it's not actually executed sequentially if you don't want it to be. Um, you have to keep in mind what you executed and what the current state of the program is at, that, at any given moment. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is like as before, you're always kind of vulnerable to getting to getting disconnected for various reasons. So if you lose internet connection or if there's some hiccup on Google's side, it, it kicks you out pretty frequently. So if that happens, then you have to kind of reload all the models, which isn't too big of a deal, but but you know, it can be kind of annoying. So just keep that in mind. 
So the first cell, as we had with the neural synth notebook, man, it's really hot. It's like really, it's like we're um, we'll have to do something about it. Like like well, I mean, there's not much we can do about it. Okay, maybe next week it'll be better. Or maybe it'll be worse. I don't know. I think as they turn on the heat, actually, that's they overshoot, right? Because now it's getting cold outside, and so they just turned on the heat, and they don't they don't know how much heat it's really producing. I think it's just this room. Is it just this room? So really, so I picked the wrong room, right? Actually, I don't think I selected this room. I can't remember. I think they just gave it to me. But um, maybe we'll just like, is the conference room empty? Maybe next week we just like secretly meet in the conference room instead of here. <laughs> like, because it's just not being used for anything, right? Because we reschedule a class for the conference room. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. Special okay. needs class. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so run the se setup cell. And the setup cell, what that is doing is it's doing a bunch of things. And you can look through the code if you want. First of all, it's instantiating this huge long variable or a list of strings. This is, you wouldn't believe how long this string is. It's a thousand elements. So it's like, it doesn't need, you can't even scroll to the end of it. Um, or you can if you, <laughs> all this is, it's a list of all the thousand ImageNet classes. And BigGen was trained on the ImageNet classes. So, um, so like these are just the category, we're gonna use them later. And then um, it imports a bunch of libraries starts a session of tensorflow it loads the big gan model module from the big gan model from this this path that we initialized in the in the top string so that's where you can see that going right there and then it um and then it basically just defines all of the sort of like um low level uh functions that we are going to be calling but for the most part you don't really have to like I said, like if you feel adventurous, definitely like if you and if you're good at coding, you can definitely look through the code and kind of get a sense of what it's doing. It's actually not necessarily all that bad, but yeah, for for our purposes, like we don't actually we're gonna be users of the code. We're just gonna be using these functions. So for example, I am I am grid takes an array of images and it draws five columns of them. So that's all you need to know. If you pass I am grid five images five images or whatever, it'll draw them. So that's just kind of like a, a useful thing for us. Um, this interpolate in shape, for example, takes two latent vectors A and B and makes an interpolation between them. So stuff like that. It's just, it's just kind of using these base level functions that we'll be using. Um, we, we had this in the um, earlier class when we did neural synth. We had stuff that was similar. similar. And this initializes the TensorFlow session. So once you have that, you should get this notebook that says, um, oh, the default version of TensorFlow is going to switch to TensorFlow 2.x. I'll have to I'll have to modify this probably. Um, that will be annoying. But oh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's less of a big deal. More that the TensorFlow stuff might have to um, get changed. Yeah. Yeah. The IM grid. You said that it takes five images. Uh, no, it's. I think I forget how it works. I think maybe. You can change it if you want, like you can make number of columns three, or I think if you give it less than five images, it'll just make that number. But we can change the image. You can also do that, yeah. Okay, uh, then another thing over here, this will let you mount your Google Drive if you want to. So uh, the reason why you might want to do that sometimes is um, we're generating images, and, um, and sometimes we're generating a lot of images, and so the way that works, remember that you don't, you're, you're on a remote computer. So if you want to do download those images, you either have to display them on the notebook and then save them manually, or you can use their, this files library, which lets you save it to the external, uh, external directory and then download it from there. But that seems to be kind of unreliable, it seems like sometimes. Where is it external? Sorry? Where is it external? Uh, where? Sorry. So it's just like Google's Google's uh, you know storage, Google storage. It will notice. So so by default, it's not Google Drive. It's actually a temporary. It's a temporary environment that only lasts as long as you know. I think it doesn't. It doesn't go away as soon as you. If you get disconnected, it doesn't. You don't lose it right away. I think it disappears after some number of hours or something. 
So it's not a big deal if you get disconnected and you save stuff. You can still download it. However, the point is that uh, G, uh, if you if you mount your G drive, um, it's kind of you can then save to there, and there you have permanent storage, and it's also easier to download from there. So that's kind of like well, you can. Think, I don't think that passes to G drive. External hard drive. No, that's like like from the from the notebook computer point of view. That's what it's happening. Yeah, it's so like, like a. It, that's the file. Like, imagine there's a machine that's the that's the password right, goes to like one year. <laughs> right, but that's not what you see in Google Drive. You see Google Drive just. I think I think it might be useful to actually like. Why don't we do this? So so like this. I'll, I usually don't make this part of the tutorial, but like let's tr let's tr show it. So this is what happens. It's going if you play this. It's going to go go to this URL in the browser, and then it'll give you an authentication code. So you just click into that. You click whatever account you are, and then you yeah, all the and then it gives you this authentication key. So you copy that. You go back to the notebook. You put it in, and then you verify it. It's temporary, so it's fine that I'm recording it. It's not going to last beyond this recording. So now uh, it's going to authenticate me, and then I will have the ability to save to this location. And this is actually my G drive. And actually, it's not just this. It's like slash my drive or something like that. I forget how it's. Uh, we'll see in, in one of the next few notebooks. But then you can save stuff to that folder, and it'll just show up magically in your G drive. Um, so it is. It's great. So now let's look at the next. So we can leave that aside for now, because now we're not going to be saving anything for just a moment. But the first cell I want to show you is just the basic thing, where we're basically um, just uh, let me also like maybe I'll full screen this. I think this will give me a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so, so okay, so like try to generate from here. So let, let me show you how this works. Um, there's a few, so first of all, like you, we see sliders and GUIs and stuff. You can actually make sliders and GUIs in the notebook. This is a nice feature of Colab. If you double click on this, you'll see it's all code. You can run the code as any other code block, but when you s click away from it, um, or, um, how is it? I think if you double click again, or what is it? I think if you hit the play button, it'll it'll go back to being a slider. I think I forget how to how to go back. But the point is that the way to make sliders is using the syntax where you'll make you'll declare a variable, and then in a comment on the same line, you write at param type slider min one max twenty, right? Step one. So that gives you a slider that will adjust the variable. So you can make your own little user interface elements, which is really neat. Um, and so that's how that was made. And now if I, I forgot how to go back to the, is it, oh, oh, you know what? You click on double click, yeah, there we go. Right, you click on the actual, um, you double click and it goes back to that. So for this, um, there's a few variables. Num samples is how many images to generate. You can generate more if you want, but remember it takes, it, you have to download them from Google. And so it just takes a little while if you generate multiple. But like, okay, let's make two, let's say. Um, where is my notebook? Oh, it's right. So here, um, and then truncation. Okay, so what are truncation and noise seed? Let me explain noise seed first, and then I'll, I'll talk about truncation. So the noise seed is a, um, it, it basically like when you generate from again, you're giving it some random numbers, right? Um, and then it gives you a random image based on those random numbers. Noise seed says um, is basically uh, will like if you have a particular noise seed, it will generate the same random numbers every time. Uh, the point of that is for reproducibility. So you, if you want to be able to exactly reproduce a particular notebook, you you turn on the noise seed. You'll see scientists do this all the time. Um, so what this means is that if you leave the noise seed and then you try to generate this again with the same settings, you'll get the exact same image. So if you want a different one, just change the noise seed. It doesn't matter to what. It's just completely random. Um, you can just you know go from 35 to 36. It's the same as going from 35 to 99. Um, now truncation 
is a scalar multiplier on all of the elements in the latent vector. So basically, if you have a truncation of zero, you'll basically just be sending it the, the, uh, z like the latent vector zeros of all zeros. And if it's one, then it's just, you know, you're changing it unchanged. So it's kind of uh, resizing the, the latent code. Now, the, the point of this is that um, as you go sort of like on the outskirts of the latent space, the space becomes bigger, but it also becomes less and less likely from a probabilistic perspective as an image to occur. And so the way you can think of this is that low truncation equals the same image all the time, but but more likely. And I don't know if it, like I used to say that it looks more coherent or more like a real object. I'm not actually sure that's 100% true. It's kind of subjective. But in at least technically, in theory, it's supposed to be sort of more likely. And then at a higher truncation, you, uh, and, and actually you could change truncation. You can make truncation 10 if you want. So like you can explode the latent vector and then you'll get images that basically look like nonsense. Um, so um, it's probably best to stick within one, but you can experiment if you want and just see what happens if you make it bigger. Um, yeah? What varies with the number of samples you have? What, uh, oh, um, the, you'll just generate more samples. Okay. So this is one yeah. and I'll generate two in the next frame. Makes sense. Okay. Um, and then, um, and so, you know, you can experiment with this. So like, you know, with the high truncation, you'll get more diversity, like more different samples that look different from each other. Uh, but maybe they may not look as realistic. Yeah. Yeah. By high truncation, what kind of number are you talking about? Like two or ten? Uh, like those are all. Those are both high. Like ten is higher than two. So there's no medium. There's just low and high. Yeah. Like like the thing is, it's trained within a particular range, and so we're generating latent uh, vectors uh, that are within the range it is trained, and so that's why it's a multiplier up to one. You know, like you don't go outside of that range, but if you do go outside the range, it'll still generate stuff. It just might start to look like weird. Um, yeah, it's worth experimenting. It's kind of, you know, it's like a fun little trick that you can do. Then, um, so okay, like, um, so now if I, if you click into this, it'll generate, oh, then fine, obviously the last thing is the category. So you can look through this, like there's a lot of weird stuff out there. Bullet train, let's try a bullet train. I'm gonna generate two bullet trains coming right up. So you see it takes a little while. Sorry? There's one bullet train, not bad. Two bullet trains. Maybe try a... Uh, I don't know, like uh, a <laughs> hamper. Let's make three hampers. Now, whatever I get on this, if I were to replay it, it would generate the exact same ones again until you change the noise seed or the truncation in that case. That would also change it. That looks more like food to me. I don't know. Yeah, like a picnic basket, but apparently it's a hamper. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, what do you put in a hamper? Hamper's for laundry, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of a, what's the thing, like a pantry? Pantry versus a hamper. So, so yeah, play with this a little bit, like, you know, just generate a few. And like one thing you can do is you could always like right click on them and save them if you like them. So that works. The normal trick. So I'll try a few. Mini skirt. Let's see how this is. This is gonna. This is. This will. I can guarantee that it won't be inappropriate. Like it. It'll. It'll be. It'll be more funny than inappropriate. Is it gonna be a person or just by itself? I mean. <laughs> okay. Missile. The the folder that we did. Sorry. To save stuff, the mounting of the so you 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 can uh, this this does, I don't have it written into this cell, but you'll see in other cells where it does where you can yeah missile. 
I'm really going off the the bandwagon here. How about a? Uh, Maybe we're gonna get to this later on, but uh, will you, do you? Could you show us one where you do it with the truncation that dramatically different? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Different? Let's let's do it right now. I'll show you how to do it. First, let's just generate the saxophone, and then it'll generate a saxophone with a bigger truncation. Look at that. That's that's like a black and white. That's like old old style. Oh, there's another one too. Okay, so let's try this. Let's let's actually go back to something that's more coherent. Um, so dogs work great. Dogs are wonderful. Um, let's see if I can find. I remember they're like yeah. Here we are. Let's do a Rottweiler. So first I'll do a Rottweiler with normal truncation. And while it's doing that, so the way to change the truncation is you can just change the slider. So instead of being look at that, so cute. Oh. The, do the dogs are really like, they're really good. ImageNet, if you don't know, has like 10 zillion images of dogs. So that's why they tend to be really good. So let's make the max instead of one, we'll make it 10. So now I'll click back into this and now I can change the truncation. Let's make the truncation like, like nine. Let's see what happens. It's going to start to look like weird. Oh, wait, what? Maybe this. I tried to make it over one. There's an argument. Invalid argument. Oh, because there's an assertion somewhere. I bet. I bet this could be turned off. This is probably built in. Like you should be able to. Okay. Well, let. Um. I wonder. <clears throat> let me try to do a hack real quick. So, like, what if I just. Okay. So, like, let's leave it at. Let's go back to the one, but now let me see if, if I just literally multiply Z by 10. Let's try that. Now it's working. So, okay, I, whatever this, there's some assertion error that I, there you go. Yeah. So I hacked it. Basically the reason why it failed is because for whatever reason, this this truncated z sample function has some sort of an assertion that says don't make the trunk don't make the vector too big, and so instead of inst see like here, instead of putting in a times ten, all it does is all the truncation does is it multiplies z. That's all it is, and so now I'm just multiplying z directly. So like okay, let's do a hundred z. Like I don't know, um, let's change the noise seed also, hundred z. And then, and then it just you know, right? It just becomes noise. But maybe like maybe at a nice like three Z, maybe we'll get some uncanny dogs. Let's just get some. Yeah. See now it's just starting to starting to just look weird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The truncation? Well, in the theory of, like, there's no truncation in the theory of GANs, per se. There's just, um, they built in truncation into the big GAN module, at least. But all, uh, it w what it would be in a GAN is it's just a scalar multiplier of the latent vector. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's move on to the next cell. The next cell is a little bit cooler. Um, what this will do is now you get to pick two classes and it will generate, um, it will generate uh, a number of frames between them. So num interps means how many interpolated frames. So 67 means 67 frames between the two endpoints. Truncation is the same. Noise seed A, so it generates two endpoints. Uh, and so noise seed A and noise seed B, probably don't really need to have two of them, but, but anyway, there's two of them for each endpoint. So if you want to change the endpoints, just change the noise seeds and then change the two categories. Can you so, say again what it was? That's the number of frames between the two. Yeah, so 67, this will generate 67 images. Um, now there's a check mark that says to save 
And the way it does to save is it'll actually generate a movie here, make video movie. Um, the w I, I set this up earlier because um, this what this should do is it'll generate all the frames, then it'll make the movie on the server side, and then it'll just download it. I've noticed that sometimes the download fails. This is like the one of the annoying things about it. like sometimes it just fails, and then you could try it again. Uh, if you try it multiple times, it'll at some point it'll work. Um, or what we could do is we could change the code to change to save the frames onto Google Drive. Something like that, but let's let's just give it a shot. Like, I'll um, so okay. Let's pick a. I'm gonna do a. So you can see like we're koala bear to mosque. So let's try a hummingbird to a dog. Let's do a dog because the dogs work so well. Uh, what's a good dog here? Norwegian elk hound. Italian greyhound. One thing about um, ImageNet, ImageNet has something like a hundred. Oh, something or 200 breeds of dogs and so the dog classifier the dog breed classifier is way better than humans so this was this is one of the first things that we beat humans at is 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 figuring out which which dog breed um, so let's do hummingbird to Norwegian elk hound and you can try your own now what will happen is it'll generate all the frames the reason why it says 0 out of 17 by the way you might wonder like why 17 is that it does the images in batches and I think the batch size is four and so it needs 17 batches to do 67 frames um, and, and actually you could even go faster if you make the batch size bigger if you uh, but like at some point if you make the batch size too big it, it'll run out of memory so I could probably do eight I bet I'm guessing um, but um, okay so if this doesn't fail it should then it should generate a movie what is see see this whole fail to fetch thing okay so if that happens to you then instead of running it again make a new cell and just simply run this command make video oh actually not make it because that'll generate the movie um well okay let, let's just try let, let me see if this will because we could we could go look up the code but if you just run this again it should at some point work Again, like the more the the better way, the more reliable way to do this would be to to put it on Google Drive. But I developed this for workshops, and in workshops, I don't want to be doing like complicated things like going to Google Drive. I just want it to download. And so, like, there's a trade-off between complicated and functional, sort of. Um, yeah. So the the options that we're picking from, category A and B, where is all the stuff? Where are we picking from? Pre images the internet, or? What? No, no, no. These are all generated images. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is not a real dog. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, category A and B. Like oh, yeah, yeah. That's ImageNet. So BigN was trained on... BigN was trained on... There we go. See, it'll work. The, usually it'll work the second time around. So make a movie. Movie 2. So, okay. Let's look at... See my... Hummingbird to... What was it? Um... Elk hound. Here we go. Oops. And it'll go back. It actually does A to B to A. I think that's by accident. A to B to A. If you go back to the exact same latent code, you can make them, you know, zigzag. Uh, yeah, so so here it does them both. It so you could see in the code that what happens is it generates all the images. That's that's usually what takes. Actually, in this case, making the movie takes just about as long. But like like this will be fine. This images variable has all your images, and then basically this just makes the movie. Um, and so. So if we, you could just run this again, and it'll it'll put the images together using FFmpeg, I think, or or maybe I I forget how it's done. Maybe it's with um like MoviePie or something like that, and then it'll try to download it. The thing that the, the thing that fails is really this. So it, you see, make video. This this actually will work fine, and then the video exists. And then really, you actually just need to do this. So yeah, this this is really what you should do. Files download. So you just if you copy this. If it ever fails, like movie.move, 
it, it will definitely generate it, but then the download will fail. And so you can actually just do this files.download. You'll have a file called movie.move um, in there. It's saved as movie.move there. And then it should, um, yeah, sometimes it's, sometimes it's a little slow. Like, you know, I guess they don't want you, you know, doing tons of upload and download. But anyway, like, you can always try to do that. And again, like the other thing you could do is just save the frames directly to Google Drive and it'll show up there. So again, you can you can see this whole make video. It um, If you just make the video name, um, oh, actually, I guess if you, yeah, if what you did was instead of video, if video name instead of movie.move, if you did this, like save, make video, and then it's like G, um, Download multiple files, okay? Yeah, movie that move. So it's the same thing. This will be the same thing. Yeah. So if you simp if you actually, I think this should work. If you did slash G drive once you are logged in, oh slash content slash G drive, and then um, it's then there's one more folder. It's like my G drive or something. It's my drive. So my drive, something like this, right? G, you can run, yeah, you can run, if you, if in a cell you start with an exclamation point, if you start a line with an exclamation point, yeah, you can run command. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I did like, a, you can do like ls, like I'm going to do that. Just oh, like, right, right. Yeah, so like you can do this. So here's my, um, well, okay, like I don't want to like write out my contents to my drive, but like the point is that this should be the if you save anything under this root it'll it'll you can make a new folder also like it won't you have to make the folder on your g drive like you know my frames and then go into g drive and make a make a folder in the root called my frames or my movies and it'll down and then it should download there um, directly it this this function will also try to download it to the computer because it's just written in there but if you do that then it will save to the actual g drive so so just in case anything goes wrong, um, you can uh, you can do that. So let me just clear this cell real quick. I'm gonna actually like if for some reason the download fails, you can try to download movie.move directly. So that's going to be useful. Okay, now this this is where it really starts to help to have um, saving to G Drive because now it's going to start generating really long movies. So this is the same thing as before, but um, right this this actually get randomized. Yeah. So so okay. So like what this will do. Is it, it'll take six random classes, or however many, let's say four random classes. Num and terps is number of frames between each one. And so now there's going to be 240 frames, and this will do a random interpolation. And this will pick random classes. However, if you want to pick your own classes, you could see that the way to do that is in the code. So instead of doing this, this get random YZ, you would just um, make that a comment, do this. And then this does get transition YZ of these classes. And here's the the um, the vector, the ones that I'd be putting in. And you can get a full list of them on this gist, by the way. Um, so, yeah. So that, that will take you, uh, wait a second, where am I? Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. But um, but okay. If you want to do a simple thing, just like uncomment this, and then this will make a random sample. So okay, let's give it a shot. This will make my movie five. So a random selection of multiple classes, and again, if the download fails, you can try to download my movie five dot move. I think this takes the. This might be weird because I think it just takes the name instead of the name dot move. Um, yeah. 
so we, could, so we could on call medical one that says get transition Y Z and then pick our own. Exactly. Yeah. Classes. What it does is it generates these uh, a set of latent vectors Z, and the the Y interp is the same except it's the class vectors, and so then that gets sent to um, to this make images from samples, and then that will actually make a movie, um, even though it's called make C failed to fetch. So okay. So if that happens, same thing. You could do files that, oh, see, I already had a cell for it from the last time that it failed. Usually like just fails once and then it just works the second time. So okay, files.download my movie five. And then the next cell is actually my favorite. Um, how are we doing in time? It is 5.30. Okay, it's not so bad. We have some time. So we should get through the end of the notebook and then we should have time to, to, um, to do some data set utils also. Um, I have a last question. Yeah. So the classes that we can pick on the website, those are each like the two insert. The one that we did before, there was two and there was one in between. Yeah. Okay. So there's five of those instead of just two. Yeah, you'll see in a second I, it, it worked. So here it is. So this is five random classes. I don't even know what they are. We can guess. What is that, an otter? Mm -hmm. like otter to uh, some kind of a bird to a Dalmatian to a airplane maybe? What is that? Yeah, I don't know. Your mileage will vary. So, so now I want to show you the the, the next slide, um, or the next next cell. This is my favorite. So this is the one where we're gonna have the most fun. Combine two categories. So what this does is you pick two cell two two classes, and it will generate one of each one. So here's our Granny Smith, apple, really nice, right? And our guacamole. And then it will it will take make a y vector which has one for both of them, so it'll generate something which is conditioned on both labels. So here's our Granny Smith guacamole. Cool. <laughs> so this is how I made my owl dogs. These are all owl dogs. Here's an owl chihuahua. Here's an owl Japanese spaniel. So this is breeding dogs and owls. They look like Harry Potter characters, don't they? So the truncation. Whoa. Oh, that's fantastic. Look at that. The discriminator is not even involved. The discriminator is just used for training, and then it's more, more or less cast aside in favor of the generator. Poor, poor, poor discriminator. Mm -hmm. um, there are various like applications which make use of the discriminator, but mostly, for the most part, its its job is to just make the generator train uh, generator generate. Um, but I think you think the discriminator could be used, for example, to to quantify how likely the sample is, because maybe you know. But okay, you you sort of get that already with. Well, no, I think I think it could be used for that way. But anyway, that's not built into this. Owl dogs, fantastic. <laughs> um, let's try a uh, okay. So most of these don't work. That's the thing. Okay, mushroom. Let's do mushroom guacamole. Why not? Right? That's a thing. Right? Is that a thing? Is there a category for people? There's not a people category per se, but there is categories that have many images with people in them. Um, so like the miniskirt, for example. 
Okay, so guacamole mushroom. It's not bad. Um, how about a... Okay, red wine and pizza. This is probably not going to... Where is it? Red wine. All right, pizza and red wine. This is probably not going to work. Pizza, red wine. It's like red pizza. Yeah, yeah. You see like kind of a rim around the pizza? Yeah. And it's kind of glistening. How about, uh, oh, how about red wine and espresso? This is, this is the thing. This is why, like, uh, there are, there's a thousand classes, so there's a million combinations. And I, I really think, like, most don't work very well. And so just, like, finding, like, finding the best ones. All right. Espresso, red wine. It's kind of, it's kind of neat, right? So, so just play with that. Like, you know, try try out a few. See if you find anything you like. Someone get something good. We should start collecting these somewhere. Like the bikini category. You got to be. Oh, there's a bikini, right? Yeah, that makes some pretty funny. Which one? Oh, I think I think that's um, like 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 a from what do you call it? Like yeah yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. ImageNet is full of wonders. Yeah. <laughs> How about a volcano and the burrito? I was just doing a pizza volcano. Pizza volcano? Pizza volcano. How did it come out? Pretty good. Yeah? Save it. This is not going to make sense, but okay. Here's the burrito. It's a great burrito, by the way, right? Yeah, that's kind of volcano shaped. A little bit. Oh hell yeah! Whoa! <laughs> Imagine the volcano erupting burrito. <laughs> Toilet tissue. No. How about wait? What is Earth? Earth star. Is that a thing? Some sort of like mushrooms or something. Yeah, right. That sounds sounds like it would be something like that. Um. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. That is great. Oh boy. Wait, I'm gonna do that. What what numbers are they? Um. Nine sixty two, right? Nine sixty three and nine eighty. Nine sixty three. And nine nine eighty, I want. Let's see how mine comes out. Oh, I probably will get the same one as you because of the noise seed, unless you change yours. That's fantastic. That is really really fantastic. Anybody else find anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> lemon pretzel. Lemon pretzel. Looks like a donut. Yeah. I feel like there's no potential to combine a lot of with strawberries. Oh, oh wow. Like a donut. Wow. More like next time. How about a projector and a car? I can find a car. Yeah, crab chops. Yeah, it's a nice one. I'm going to leave it. I'm definitely going to leave it at the. 
because this is the example notebook and that's the beautiful that's a beautiful the pizza pizza volcano that's a new favorite <laughs> Um, what is this? Oh, this, okay, this is one cell. I think, I can't remember what this does. It's an experimental cell. This does something that makes, I think, rotations of things. Oh, yeah, and then this is, this one I wanted to show also. Okay, so the last thing I'll show is regenerating images with, with Big Gen. Okay, so here's the idea with regenerating images. Um, Big Gen is conditioned on a latent vector Z and the class vector Y. The class vector Y is the set of image net probabilities, right? So like, for example, when we did a pizza net volcano, the, the Y vector that we gave it was all zeros, except it had a one for pizza and a one for volcano. So uh, one thing you can do as a little trick is you can download a classifier, like some kind of an uh, image net classifier, and then download an image from the internet. And then um, I'm going to get out of full screen for this real quick full screen, uh, download an image on the internet, and then, um, and then classify it with the, um, the image net, uh, well, sorry, classify it with the classifier that will give you a set of probabilities for the 1000 image net categories. And then you just take that vector and you simply feed it to big gen. So then you try to regenerate the exact same class probabilities that you gave to big gen. And so what it should do especially if you give it something that it's that is with is one of the categories um is it'll regenerate it so so okay so let's try some let's try something that will work first um how about so let's do pizza like pizza is going to be easy this this will work really great so i'll just take this image um and then i will i will copy the link copy image address so if you copy the image address and then, and then, okay, I have that. For, first of all, you run this cell. This will declare the URL to image function. This will download for, uh, uh, an image from the, from the web. And this will classify the image. And then this will load a classifier. So first run this. And then in the next cell, where it says URL to image, you'll place in a different image. So I'll put in this image of the pizza. You and then, change the first one, didn't you? No. Okay, just... And then in the second one here, in this cell, you place the URL of your image. It will. You can follow the code. It's actually. It's, it should be relatively straightforward. So here it'll download the image. Image to equals URL to image. So that'll give you the actual pixels. Then it will run the image through classify image using the classifier. That will give us a set of probabilities y pred. Um, and then we say okay, generate one sample truncation 0 0.5. Let's even make it higher. Noise seed 99. And then Z, it actually does randomly. If you really wanted to do this great, you would actually try to like uh, figure out the best Z. There's ways of doing that. So you could try to actually like gradient descent to the best Z. So there's, there's, um, there's a style again encoder that does that really well. Um, but, but otherwise like, yeah, it's, there's um, Z. So sort of, this will just be <laughs> random Z. And then Y is going to give us a bunch of zeros and then it will place and then it will over, uh, it'll take Y predictions and it'll just, it'll, it'll make Y will be, be equal to Y predictions basically. And then it will, um, what is this image zero? Oh yeah, then it just resizes the image so it can display it. So let's try it. So this downloads pizza, get, oh, what is this? What are you doing to me? None type has no attributes, get item. I hope this, I hope it's not broken my url to image code it's sometimes like the way that you download images gets changed let me try a different image this is, if someone else gets it if someone else has the same error then it might mean my code is broken is it is working okay then i just probably had a bad Okay, let's try this. Oh, maybe it doesn't like PNGs. It might be possible that it doesn't like PNGs, but um, I might be wrong about that. Let's see. Okay, this worked. So it downloaded the image. Now it's running it through the classifier. And then it will, then it'll give us 
some goodness. Is it recreating the whole image habitat or is like one specific thing? It's just recreating whatever image from from those y probabilities. Like it's it's not exactly recreating it, it's just creating something that has the same y. Like the best thing to do is to is to backprop z also. So look at that. There's the left one is the actual pizza that we downloaded and then this right one is the one that was generated. Um, now if you use something, if you try to put in something that's not in the data set, it will, it will, you know, like, uh, okay, if we, if we just got a whole bunch of people, it'll, it'll probably, I'll, uh, let's, let's see what it does. Like, um, people. Sorry. Um, let's try this. Fish? Uh, I think there is a fish somewhere. Yeah, there's definitely a couple different kinds of fish that I saw. Yeah, there's the, actually there's a whole undersea. There's a whole undersea one. So okay, there's no people class in in this, right? But there are um, lots of images with that have people in them inside of ImageNet that are under different classes, and so this will should give us probabilities for random things that have people in them, and then it should just give us weird people. Basically, I think that's what's going to happen. Um, or it might just give us nonsense, but let's see. Mm -hmm. So when you regenerate, if you don't change the parameters, could you get like slightly different version of the same image or different image or what? If you don't, oh, this is so weird. <laughs> I think it's like a camera or something. Um, uh, if you don't regenerate, um, if you keep doing regenerate, but you don't necessarily change okay. the parameters. Yeah, if you don't change the parameter, if you don't change the noise seed, you'll get the same image every time because it gives you the same z vector. Oh, so it doesn't, it doesn't like randomly regenerate a new z vector every time you. It does, but but the thing about the noise seed is that it makes it give you the same random number until because the whole point is for reproducibility. Yeah. Um, so it's not it, technically it doesn't seem so random, but it is still randomly generated, but from the same seed. Um, so all numbers are pseudo random, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's all for this notebook. Um, maybe just like try a few of these examples. How, how just play with it for a few minutes, and then we'll get to some other stuff. Yeah. Uh, could you show again how uh, to set the um, yeah, like classes and create yeah. interpolations among multiple random classes? Oh, no. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that would be here. Mm -hmm. uh, multiple class interpolation. Yeah, so if you go into the code here, and I should at some point like make this make a separate cell for it, that would be a good idea. But you see what, what the code actually is? It goes, okay, classes, it gives us some classes. And if in like the, the function that it generates y and z from just does random yz. You notice that it doesn't take the classes. This generates random. So if you just change it to use this one instead, then this will take in these classes. And then and then it won't be so random. Right, and then um, you can get these indexes from the from either the list, or um, there's a link to a gist that has them all in a, one big text file. So just play with that for a few minutes and then and then with the last like 30 minutes or so we'll get into some data set util stuff. I'm going to pause this for a second. Anybody get some good stuff? <coughs> the favorite thing, my favorite thing that I got was actually messing around in that very first one by bumping up the truncation. Yeah, getting some weird abstract stuff. Yeah, really kind of really what's your sweet spot? Where did you, what's your truncation? Uh, right now it's just at, two. I think it's at seven. I think doing stuff that's just like two or three or something like that, you get a little sweet spot where you, you still get stuff that looks like it's within the range of the generator, but it's, you know, uncanny. I mean, it's already pretty uncanny, but you know, maybe even uncanny by big GAN standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's more like a top art than anything else. <laughs> Is this where you can like look up the tag, right? <laughs>
Yes. Uh, there's a link in the, in the gist. There's a gist link. So do you see it? That's right here. A list of the files can be seen there. But those classes are associated with ImageNet itself, right? So you can begin is the is this is that's what it begins is trained on. But what I mean is like like I just searched for ImageNet classes like that would theoretically also yeah. go. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we'll switch gears and we'll do a few more practical things. Um, making better time today. Yeah? The interpolations here, are they linear or are they like hyperspherical? I think, I think actually, I don't remember. There's a there's implementation of both both linear and hyperspherical. And I don't remember what they're looking under the, under the hood. I think you have to look inside. I think they might be using the hyperspherical. Yeah. Okay, so shall we switch gears a little bit? Okay. So, uh, is this recording? Yeah. Okay. The thing that I want to show you now is... Oh, and let me actually just as a... Um, the next thing we'll do is uh, I'm going to show you a few... Um, data set tools. So there, there's kind of two things we want to look at. We'll, we'll start to talk a little bit about, this isn't necessarily just for prep uh, for next week. Like we'll be looking at a little bit more at the actual repository, like the GAN repositories. But, um, but this is kind of g generally speaking useful. Sometimes you want to work with big data sets. So I'll try to answer two questions today. One is how do you get big data sets? Um, and and there's no simple answer to that, first of all. Um, so I'll just give you a few resources that might be useful. And the second question will be just like a little bit of pre-processing stuff. And um, all of this is kind of well documented online, so it's not necessarily stuff that needs to needs a long lecture or anything. I just kind of want to demo it. Um, now, getting big data sets. So like what what have I done? What have other people done? So there's no there's no short answer to this, right? Because data is not like there's no like one big data place. There's just kind of like various places where data seems to accumulate. Social media, for one. Um, now, social media is not always very easy to get that data from, um, and uh, so that's that's one thing. There's also publicly available data sets that have been, you know, compiled for various reasons. Sometimes scientific purposes. Sometimes you know for various other reasons. Um, so, for example, like I made a GAN, I trained it on WikiArt. So this is just something that I knew about WikiArt. And WikiArt, you, we have a scraper of this online. So if you, um, that's that's actually located in um, ML for a got uh, what is it ML for a yeah let's do this and then we'll just go to the GitHub. In ML for a guides, which we're going to look at in a second, actually, because we're going to look at the data set utils. But in one of the things is a script for scraping wiki art, which should still be pretty functional. And this has uh, documentation for how to use it. So that would be scraping wiki art. So this would be one way of scraping wiki art. Um, and Oh, where am I? And then, uh, so that's one thing that's out there. Now, there's a few repositories that there are nice ways of scraping, and I'm going to show you at least one because I worked on it recently. Flickr. Uh, Flickr is a huge trove of images, obviously. Um, and it's all public, right? Uh, it's not all public, I don't think, but, but uh, certainly a lot of it is public. Um, and as it turns out, there is uh, a bunch of ways of scraping Flickr. You do need to get a, a, a token, like an authentication key from Flickr, and there's info for doing that. And I was looking to scrape this gigantic group. You see this? Beautiful scenery and landscapes, 40,000 members, 700,000 photos almost. Um, and it's actually quite well curated, right? So these are actually some of the more popular ones. Um, but, and, and not all of it is like, sometimes you'll find random stuff, like 
some picture of a birthday party or like a, or a cartoon or something, but, but it's actually pretty good. And there's just a ton of images here. So the question is, can this be scraped? The answer is, yes, it can. And, um, yeah. So yeah, like you said, sometimes you get stuff that doesn't fit in there, right? So like, what's a good, I guess, signal noise ratio, right? Like, if you've got some stuff in your data set that doesn't actually fit what you're looking for, right? How much of that can you have before it really starts messing? So the great thing about deep learning is that it's really, really resistant to noise. And like it, it can actually deal with quite a bit. You know, you want to kind of take whatever steps you can to get rid of like at least, let's say you, you have an easy way of getting rid of 50% of the noise. Sometimes you can. Right. Um, then, then it's worth it. You know, you don't want to clean up all the dust because that starts to get really tedious. And, you know, it's difficult. So um, there's various, various tricks you can use. So for example, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually show you what I did for this, for this exact, I'll, I'll show you in a second, like one thing that I did. So this um, is a scraper, that, a really nice one that was written by Sam Levine, who actually is a teacher here. Um, I think he's teaching here this semester, right? Does anyone have him? Maybe he's not here right now. Yeah, he hasn't been here for a couple of years. Oh, really? Okay, I'm really, yeah, yeah. Uh, my info's out of date. After the LinkedIn scraping thing, I think it's back Oh, really? That was a big issue here? Uh, yeah, it's stuff. I see. Mm. Well, anyhow, Sam's a good guy. And I uh, made a nice Flickr scraper, and I actually um, made uh, a, a change to this that, that is now in the main repository, which lets you scrape groups. So before he added just scraping by searches, but searches is, are quite noisy. The groups I find are really good because you have to, like diff, depending on different groups, they might have curation standards and things like that. And so those are a little bit nicer. And so this can actually, um, this has info for how to scrape this. Now here's the thing that you do. Once you, you clone this, and I have it in my, like I have it here, um, where is it? So basically, So I'm inside of my Flickr scrape, so I can open that in Finder. And there's a file in there. Once I made it, there's a file in there called credentials.json, which I'm not going to show. Because it contains inside of it a JSON string structured like this, which contains my API key and my API secret. Now the way you get an API key and the, se and the key per secret from, from Flickr is you click on this link and this tells you how to get a key. And it's, it's actually really easy. You have to fill out this little form that tells them that you tell them what you want to use it for. It doesn't even matter what you write, I don't think, because it just gives you a key right away. You know, it's just like a first defense, basically. And then you would make a JSON file and, and put that in the folder there. And then you can use the scraper. So here, for example, for me to use the scraper, the Flickr, the beautiful scenery scraper, is this, I grab this URL, and then you see it goes python scraper.py dash dash group, group URL. So I could just do, um, and I already scraped it, so let me just quickly like, I'm gonna delete this, and I'll just go python scraper, or, or actually I just do py, oh right, <laughs> um, python scraper.py uh, group, link and then I also do max pages. This will say how many pages to download. Let's just download like one, one page right now. Um, I think that's all, so let's try that. Searching for group. Now what it's doing, it, this will take a while, but you, you can let it run. It's actually quite reliable and the nice thing about it is that if, you, if it gets cut off, you just run the exact same command again and it will re-download the metadata and then it will skip over any uh, images that you've already downloaded. So it's smart enough to, to like, you can resume download basically. Look how fast, now it's already downloading 500 images. I think it's 500 per page. So here they're being downloaded right now as we speak. Oh, what? Oh, I, the JSON file, right? There it is. Just like that. So I've recently downloaded about 500,000 of them. <laughs> Now, it turns out that if you dig around long enough, and I think especially as you go to later pages, 
it starts to get a little messier. Um, like you start to get random photos. So I think, okay, is there a smart way that I could filter this? Um, because 400,000 images is a lot to filter. Um, but one thing that I, that, that I thought I could do was, okay, um, there's another uh, repository out there called, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Deep Lab PyTorch. This gives you, uh, this repository will produce uh, semantic maps of, uh, let's see if I can get a good example of this. Um, mm, Oh, it's like uh, in blade. I don't think I have actually. Uh, I don't have a sample, but the point is, what it does is it what it does is it gives you um, an image that's the same size as the image, and it, every pixel is segmented to a class. So it does it does uh, pixel by pixel pr uh, uh, like segmentation to a set of classes like the same um, and it's not ImageNet it's the Coco classes so it's like you know person bicycle tree whatever and so then you could do some post processing this is a little trickier because I don't there's not necessarily pre made tools to do this but it's just like for strategy purposes you could do then you could use that. And then you could sum up all of the pixels to all the classes, and then you can make some filters. Be like anything that doesn't have at least eighty percent of the pixels belong to these this set of classes. I'll just delete, and then you know, out with it. So stuff like that. There's other machine learning tools out there that you can leverage to um, to organize your data sets. Another thing you can do is like um, in the ML for A guides, there's feature extraction notebooks that let you do things like reverse image search. So you could start with a query image and you then you can get a list of all of the you know 100 or 1000 images that are most similar to it so if you you can start with a bad image and then tr delete all the images that are close to it or start with a good image and keep all the images that are close to it um, those are things that will you know improve your improve the quality of your data set stuff like that um, now there's other things to scrape there is an Instagram scraper. I think I even have it. That was like, you could also feed these into a classifier and then do like clustering. Sometimes. Yeah, you could do clustering. Now, of course, like there's it, there's a lack of some high level tools for that. You would have to code it up a little bit, but there, that's a much that's a much needed um, area that you know something needs to be engineered there. Anyhow, um, this is a really nice Instagram scraper, and it lets you scrape. It works unbelievably well, and it works the same way. Uh, you have to. Um, this is the code. You go okay. You once you've installed it, you just run from your terminal Instagram scraper. Here's a username. Then you put in your username and your password, and that's your credentials. Doesn't need, it actually just logs into Instagram? I think um, it doesn't use an API key. And it works remarkably consistently. If you download your own, it'll download. I think it'll download everything. It'll even download your um, your uh, what do you call it? Those temporary the temp stories. stories. I downloaded like Snoop Dogg's entire like Instagram. He posts like fifty thousand images. There's some some accounts out there that post like everything. You know, so like um, I might have gotten rid of it, but I think at some point I had like Snoop's Instagram. And uh, you can't download other people's stories, obviously. Um, I think I'm not sure, but anyhow, um, a there's a. Um, well, you you can download, yeah, yeah, but I don't I don't know if it like the, take gives you the archive of, of stories. I think maybe that's just something you can get of yourself, maybe. Um, but um, right. Oh, and then to scrape a private user's media, you must be an approved follower. You can also scrape for hashtags. You can scrape multiple usernames. You can scrape even a text file of usernames. Um, it's really functional. And occasionally it's not working. Like I feel like Instagram, it's like a little cat and mouse thing. Instagram sometimes changes their API so that this breaks. 
but then um, usually gets corrected pretty quickly. It's one of these things where like, yeah, you'll see, seems to be working as long as the post is video display. Yeah, it seems to be, you know, there's various little bugs, but it seems to work okay. And um, there's a lot of Instagram accounts out there that are, you know, they're not like necessarily um, like a, um, a, you know, just a person, but it'll be like a group account. So for example, there are scenery accounts on Instagram. And so there are some that have, you know, tens of thousands of images and you can just scrape all of them just like that. Um, other things to scrape. I don't think, um, I don't think there's so much luck with something like Facebook. Um, I'm not sure about Twitter. What else would you want to scrape and scrape in a perfect world? So we have a lot of images between Instagram and Flickr, like, and you know, well-organized and stuff. Um, so those are kind of the, the best ones. I also, I should show you also, um, scrapers, uh, here, Aaron. How do you spell his name? Uh, uh, you guys know Aaron? He's, uh, yeah, there we go, Montoya Moraga. Um, Aaron uh, was a student and a teacher here. So maybe some of you know him. He wrote a very lovely collection of scrapers for Google, uh, Google and Bing. Um, scrapers. So Montoya Moraga slash scrapers. Um, and these are a year old, so like Google changes its, you know, they, they change this really quite often, but this, this lets you scrape Google images and Bing images. And he also has his own Instagram scraper, although I think the one that I just showed you is probably better. And I don't know what this is, mugshots. I don't know what that, I don't know what that's referring to. Maybe somebody else knows. Uh, maybe there's some website called Mugshots. I don't know. <laughs> Would it open the pop over the screen? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mugshots.com. I think it's like prisoners. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, all that stuff is online. So scrapers, that's really cool. So you can use that. So, okay, now what happens when you get a folder of images? So like this, I have this folder of images. They're all different sizes and all that. Um, very frequently, a lot of the, let's say, um, repositories like GAN repositories will require that the images are, you know, pre-formatted so that they all have the same number of channels, that they all have this uh, certain size. Um, now a lot of the times they won't because maybe they'll do that on the fly. They'll actually, whatever, they'll take the raw data and they'll, and the images have to be uniform size when, when they go into the GAN, but they, maybe the repository handles that part of it, the pre-processing. But in case it doesn't, there is a very nice tool in ML for a, um, in the guides, which I'm going to show you really quickly. Because I use it, I use this tool all the time. Like I, I, I made this for ML for a, and I think I use it more than anybody. I just like dataset utils. This is basically a. Uh, it's documented here. This will let you take a folder of images or a movie, and it will post process it, make it a uniform size. Uh, it might segment it if you wanted to. It will, it will make multiple copies of images, at maybe different crops. So that's another thing you can do to make a bi uh, small data set bigger is uh, cheaply, is to do what's called augmenting the data set. Augmenting the data set means you take, an, you take each image and then maybe you make a bunch of copies of it that, have, that are slightly distorted or rotated or backwards or, um, or different located location crops. Um, or maybe sheared. There's all these things that you can do that actually um, cheaply improve the performance of the model uh, because you're giving it artificially sort of augmented data. So this, this has a bunch of utilities for it. So I'll just show you a very simple use case right now. I have this folder of images, group this, right? And so what I'm going to do I've already done this before. Um, let's actually go to, um, let's see, ML for A. 
ML for that github.io. Oh no, that, not that. Um, ML for guides. Oh, where are my guides? Oh, it's it's actually. Then to utils, and then once once all you have to install a bunch of repositories, and then it's just like Python data set utils. You can get some help, and this will give you all the options. And so now I go okay, input source. So just because I'm running low, oh, let me quickly just so that I don't.